announcements. This is not a church service. So relax, smile, laugh, do what you got to do. I don't normally use microphones. Um, I want to thank Al for asking me, even though I was his seventh or eighth choice to announce him. Everybody else ducked out and I'm here, so I don't have to do a real good job. I've known Ferber since the 60s. Um, he was one of the few people I talked to when I came back from Vietnam because he wanted to argue about why I shouldn't have been there after I was there. And it uh, made sense to me. Uh, my reading of Al goes back to Salvation and the Bees, uh, the Badlands, uh, Applejack Days, and the original Gus. Um, I'm really thrilled that, that this version of Gus has come out and I'm thrilled that if you've read Ferber as long as I have, you see the change in his writing over the course of the past few years, and I think that has something to do with maybe he's happy, hard to believe he could be happy in his life. <laughs> Looking at him, you'll never be able to tell it, because he's a pain in the ass and he dogs you until you come and do what he wants you to do, but I'm really thrilled to be here and, and, and listen to Gus, and the, the more recent Gus poems have knocked me on my ass. And uh, with that, let me present Gus and Al Ferber. Hi. I guess now I'm going to have to do this. Um, I just wanted to uh, make mention of the uh, person who introduced me at the last reading. He um, wrote the introduction to my book and his name is Paul Marino. In this image that you see on the screen, he's the man in the center. And he couldn't be here today. He just wanted me to let all of you know that he has no association with the Gatta or the Gambino family. Uh, Jack does. Uh, I'm gonna start uh, straight ahead with the reading because I think you all know the history of Gus and how he came about. And uh, I'll announce the first poem, obligatory birthday poem. A calendar wedge split through the center of his ruby, forcing Gus to put the molecules of his life under a microscope, and sure enough, there were none of the originals. No more waiting for the priest to put on his robes and other assorted vestments. Okay. In the sacristy before 6.30 mass at age 11. No more nauseating incense swirling through his morning nostrils. No more running up the alley at age 12 to escape the cops for smoking a butt on the corner with his... I, I... I, I should tell you that uh, after the last reading, um, I had a relationship renewed with a, a cousin of mine that uh, had gone dormant for a number of years. And uh, she had an idea about the Gus poems and about the neighborhood that we grew up in. And the idea was to go back and uh, take some photographs. And this first slide that you see up here is the first slide uh, from that experience. We went back to the neighborhood. She took the pictures. And uh, I nicknamed her the shooter. Uh, you'll find out later why. At any rate, I just want to introduce you to uh, the photographic poetry of Joanne Gorman. And now the next poem. It's called Tag. Gus claims that he and Nancy used to play tag in that backyard. Her fence, he claims, had a hole in it. He claims they used it, like when Alice was chasing after that white rabbit and fell through the hole in the tree. And he further claims those windows used to be open in summer, but now they're boarded up for sheriff's sale. And he says he and Nancy weren't scared of those dark-faced garbage men that worked in the alley 
and he claims that his and Nancy's ghosts are locked inside that empty house like chip stones from carvings of eventual images. How are we doing? Oh, that's right. This is not a religious experience. I, I forgot. I'm sorry. This is called Bubblegum Machine Caper. Um, I'm going to read the poem and then I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, remember the name that is Gus that I mentioned. Uh, Gus and Bobby Grasso were monkeying around in front of the Italian barbershop on 10th Street and somehow or other managed to knock over the bubblegum machines, scattering at least a thousand multicolored balls of bubblegum across the cobblestones and trolley tracks. And Bobby said, shit, Gus, the cops will probably throw us in jail if they catch us. And with that, they took off like a pair of frightened cats and for two solid weeks hid out in their houses, making endless excuses while they didn't want to go out and play. Uh, the story is that with the slide that you're looking at is the lot the vacant lot where the Italian barber shop used to be, okay? And the name Bobby Grasso is significant in that uh, he later became a cop and he became a, uh, a captain in the Philadelphia Police Department in charge of homicide investigations. And whenever you would see a story about a uh, fantastic murder, you would see on television Bobby Grasso being interviewed. And he later distinguished himself uh, in a lawsuit for all you attorneys in the room. And the lawsuit happened to be a uh, sexual discrimination lawsuit. And uh, it was a female police officer who brought the suit. And the city lost and Bobby hasn't been on television since. <laughs> just so that I share that with you. Okay. Uh, next poem is called Smashing a Cherry. The cops said the wheel of that milk truck rolled over that guy's head like well, like smashing a cherry with a hammer. And well, there was red all over the cobblestones and concrete and the street cleaners out with hard bristle brooms sweeping up the mess and traffic snarled for blocks. And Gus said he damn near got sick to his stomach when he saw those two blackbirds up there sitting on the telephone wire thinking about free lunch. <laughs> it was a traumatic experience. <laughs> okay, next one, Cowboys and Indians. Gus said he didn't know what was going on when his mother, hear that mom? <laughs> took him to school that first day when he was six years old and just getting good at playing cowboys and Indians. He figured it was just a temporary inconvenience and sooner or later he'd be back on the streets killing and being killed by imaginary bullets and arrows. Eight years tops, he thought because no one told him anything when he was in first grade about high school. <laughs> Which seemed to him like just another four-year delay of games penalty. And then somebody let something slip about this other thing called college. And then a job. And Gus said, 
Just hold on a minute. Would someone like to tell me just what the hell is going on and what the hell am I supposed to tell the cowboys and the Indians who've been waiting for me all these years? Do you want me to tell you another story? <laughs> I'm not going to. Uh, next poem is called Flip Top Desks, and I'll get to that as soon as I have a drink of water. I almost tripped on the wire. Did you see that? I'm proud of myself. Gus says back in grammar school he had a wooden flip-top desk with metal hinges, an empty inkwell. Wrote in pencil till second grade. Fought with Joe McDermott when he threw Gus's hat on top of car. Loved his third grade teacher, Miss McGowan, uncontrollably. Scrambled for coins when the money man threw dimes and nickels in the schoolyard. Ate bologna sandwiches every day for seven years. <laughs> Mom, where are you? <laughs> I've got a score to set up. And Tom ate pound cake every day. My mother thought I ate it. Anyway, back to the poem. Uh, I lost my place. Okay. Okay. Except for tuna fish on Fridays. Do you remember what the last reference was in the poem? It had something to do with food. Played St. Joseph in the Christmas play, age six, engaged in the battle of snowball fights on the way to school, complained of too much homework, read his library book about Abraham Lincoln, fascinated by the stovepipe hat of Abraham and the log cabin in Illinois where Abe was born. And then there was that certain something about Rosemary, who lived just up the street in seventh grade that kept Gus awake at night. Imagine that. <laughs> this is called First Love. Her pretty face and prematurely well-developed breasts made their way into one of Gus's first wet dreams. She, 11, he 12. That winter, he wrestled her down in the snow, sat on top of her, rubbed snow in her face, and something funny happened in his pants. When she was 12 and he 13, he walked her almost home one night to the corner of their street where she stood against the wall of the Italian barber shop on 10th Street and Gus kissed her for the first time. When she was 15, he 16, Gus kissed her again on the front step of her house, holding her close to him, asking her to be his steady girl because he was in love he knew the feeling would last forever. She said she felt the same. In the back row of the Century Theater on Erie Avenue, on Sunday afternoon, exploring what they knew of love, leaving love marks on each other's necks, ignoring previews of coming attractions where he would leave her crying at her kitchen table as he went stumbling after another and yet another love.
This one's called Partners in Crime. Back when they were still playmates, and Nancy lived at 3843, and he lived at 3841 North Delhi Street, they watched that fence between their yards sag and sag till finally it collapsed completely. They would go to the grocery store to buy penny candies, to the candy store to buy 10 cent cones of Breyer's ice cream, to the German bakery to buy jelly donuts and cinnamon buns, back when Nancy was nine and he was eight, playing with dirt in the window boxes, playing hide and seek, listening to Charlotte Kitchen singing about somebody named Nini Kapula, who liked the hairy banana. And sometimes they would stretch the truth, just like a rubber band, until it nearly snapped back at them, like the time on Halloween, they went all the way to the convent at St. Stephen's, just to get an extra cookie and were discovered by Gus's parents on their way back home at the railroad bridge on Erie Avenue. And that time, Gus let Nancy do all the talking. Anybody have any questions? Okay, <clears throat> this is called Street Corners and Organ Grinders. Gus remembers hanging out on street corners in groups of four or more, breaking curfew, singing a cappella, note, tone, word, and song, through screens and open doorways in the summer a hint of magic in the shadows, choreographing anger on a concrete sidewalk, listening for the smooth moan of saxophone in the park, where, behind the carousel, she let them in the dark, where wooden horses pranced to organ music. Still with me? Just checking. It's called Street Sorority. On the kickball streets of Philadelphia, women with printed house dresses sit with dusty thighs on trolley stop benches, dreaming incessantly of imagined love affairs, hanging out in supermarkets, buying cat food and kitty litter, carrying their package in the twiny handled all day shopping bags of their sad sorority attending clotheslines on the half bowl roofs of Philadelphia, stepping delicately between mounds of pit pigeon droppings, each breath a labored sigh of boredom. Below them on the stickball streets of Philadelphia, they hear the lunatic voices of their children. 